Part One of Letters from a Cat by H. H. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Chapter One. My dear Helen, that is what your mother calls you. I know, for I jumped up on her writing table just now and looked while she was out of the room and i am sure i have as much right to call you so as she has for if you were my own little kitty and looked just like me i could not love you any more than i do how many good naps i have had in your lap and how many nice bits of meat you have saved for me out of your own dinner oh i'll never let a rat or a mouse touch anything of yours so long as i live I felt very unhappy after you drove off yesterday, and did not know what to do with myself. I went into the barn, and thought I would take a nap on the hay, for I do think going to sleep is one of the very best things for people who are unhappy. But it seemed so lonely without old Charlie stamping in his stall, that I could not bear it. So I went into the garden, and lay down under the damask rose bush, and caught flies. There is a kind of fly round that bush which I like better than any other I ever ate. You ought to see that there is a very great difference between my catching flies and your doing it. I have noticed that you never eat them, and I have wondered that when you were always so kind to me, you could be so cruel as to kill poor flies for nothing. I have often wished that I could speak to you about it. Now that your dear mother has taught me to print, I shall be able to say a great many things to you which I have often been unhappy about, because I could not make you understand. I am entirely discouraged about learning to speak the English language, and I do not think anybody takes much trouble to learn ours, so we cats are confined entirely to the society of each other, which prevents our knowing so much as we might and it is very lonely too in a place where there are so few cats kept as in amherst if it were not for mrs hitchcock's cat and judge dickinson's i should really forget how to use my tongue when you are at home i do not mind it for although i cannot talk to you i understand every word that you say to me and we have such good plays together with the red ball that is put away now in the bottom drawer of the little workstand in the sitting-room. When your mother put it in, she turned round to me and said, Poor pussy, no more good plays for you till Helen comes home. And I thought I should certainly cry. But I think it is very foolish to cry over what cannot be helped. So I pretended to have got something into my left eye and rubbed it with my paw. It is very seldom that I cry over anything, unless it is spilt milk. I must confess I have often cried when that has happened, and it always is happening to cat's milk. They put it into old broken things that tip over at the least knock, and then they set them just where they are sure to be most in the way. Many's the time Josiah has knocked over that blue saucer of mine in the shed, and when you have thought that I have had a nice breakfast of milk, I had nothing in the world but flies, which are not good for much more than just a little sort of relish. I am so glad of a chance to tell you about this, because I know when you come home you will get a better dish for me. I hope you found the horse chestnuts which I put in the bottom of the carriage for you. I could not think of anything else to put in which would remind you of me, but I am afraid you will never think that it was I who put them there, and it will be too bad if you don't, for I had a dreadful time climbing up over the dasher with them, and both my jaws are quite lame from stretching them so, to carry the biggest ones I could find. There are three beautiful dandelions out on the terrace, but I don't suppose they will keep till you come home. A man has been doing something to your garden, but though I watched him very closely all the time, I could not make out what he was about. I am afraid it is something you will not like. But if I find out more about it, I will tell you in my next letter. Goodbye. 
your affectionate pussy chapter two my dear helen i do wish that you and your father would turn around directly wherever you are when you get this letter and come home as fast as you can if you do not come soon there will be no home left for you to come into i am so frightened and excited that my paws tremble and i have upset the ink twice and spilled so much that there is only a little left in the bottom of the cup and it is as thick as hasty pudding so you must excuse the looks of this letter and i will tell you as quickly as i can about the dreadful state of things here not more than an hour after i had finished my letter to you yesterday i heard a great noise in the parlour and ran in to see what was the matter there was mary with her worst blue handkerchief tied over her head her washing-day gown on and a big hammer in her hand as soon as she saw me she said there's that cat always in my way and threw a cricket at me and then shut the parlour door with a great slam so i ran out and listened under the front windows for i felt sure she was in some bad business she did not want to have known such a noise i never heard all the things were being moved and in a few minutes what do you think out came the whole carpet right on my head i was nearly stifled with the dust and felt as if every bone in my body must be broken but i managed to creep out from under it and heard mary say if there isn't that torment of the cat again i wish to goodness helen had taken her along then i felt surer than ever that some mischief was on foot and i ran out into the garden and climbed up the old apple tree at the foot of the steps and crawled out on to a branch from which i could look directly into the parlour windows oh my dear helen you can fancy how i felt to see all the chairs and tables and bookshelves in a pile in the middle of the floor the books all packed in big baskets and mary taking out window after window as fast as she could i forgot to tell you that your mother went away last night i think she has gone to hadley to make a visit and it looks to me very much as if mary meant to run away with everything which could be moved before she comes back after a while that ugly irish woman who lives in mr slater's house came into the back gate you know the one i mean the one that threw cold water on me last spring when i saw her coming i felt sure that she and mary meant to kill me while you were all away so i jumped down out of the tree and split my best claw in my hurry and ran off into baker's grove and stayed there all the rest of the day in dreadful misery from cold and hunger there was some snow in the hollows and i wet my feet which always makes me feel wretchedly and i could not find anything to eat except a thin dried up old mole they are never good in the spring really nobody does know what hard lives we cats lead even the luckiest of us after dark i went home but mary had fastened up every door even the little one into the back shed so i had to jump into the cellar window which is a thing i never like to do since i got that bad sprain in my shoulder from coming down on the edge of a milk pan i crept up to the head of the kitchen stairs as still as a mouse if i'm any judge and listened there for a long time to try and make out from mary's talk with the irishwoman what they were planning to do but i never could understand irish and although i listened till i had cramps in all my legs from being so long in one position i was no wiser even the things mary said i could not understand and i usually understand her very easily i passed a very uncomfortable night in the carrot bin as soon as i heard mary coming down the cellar stairs this morning i hid in the arch and while she was skimming the milk i slipped upstairs and ran into the sitting-room everything there is in the same confusion the carpet is gone and the windows too and i think some of the chairs have been carried away all the china is in great baskets on the pantry floor 
and your father and mother's clothes are all taken out of the nursery closet and laid on chairs it is very dreadful to have to stand by and see all this and not be able to do anything i don't think i ever fully realized before the disadvantage of being only a cat i have just been across the street and talked it all over with the judge's cat but she is very old and stupid and so taken up with her six kittens who are the ugliest i ever saw that she does not take the least interest in her neighbour's affairs mrs hitchcock walked by the house this morning and i ran out to her and took her dress in my teeth and pulled it and did all i could to make her come in but she said no no pussy i'm not coming in to-day your mistress is not at home i declare i could have cried i sat down in the middle of the path and never stirred for half an hour i heard your friend hannah dorrance say yesterday that she was going to write to you to-day so i shall run up the hill now and carry my letter to her i think she will be astonished when she sees me for i am very sure that no other cat in town knows how to write do come home as soon as possible your affectionate pussy p s two men have just driven up to the front gate in a great cart and they are putting all the carpets into it oh dear oh dear if i only knew what to do and i just heard mary say to them be as quick as you can for i want to get through with this business before the folks come back chapter three my dear helen i am too stiff and sore from a terrible fall i have had to write more than one line but i must let you know that my fright was very silly and i am very much mortified about it the house and the things are all safe your mother has come home and i will write and tell you all just as soon as i can use my pen without great pain some new people have come to live in the nelson house very nice people i think for they keep their milk in yellow crockery pans they have brought with them a splendid black cat whose name is caesar and everybody is talking about him he has the handsomest whiskers i ever saw i do hope i shall be well enough to see him before long but i wouldn't have him see me now for anything your affectionate pussy end of part one